Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are Pull on the Call podcast. My name is Mandy Mack. And I am Chris Rivers. <laughs> and today we are so excited. We are here with yeah. the amazing Stacy, who owns Boston Pole Fitness. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stacy, for being with us here today. Yeah, thanks for yeah. having me. This is awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> That's true. Can't wait to learn more about you. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to Finally. <laughs> <laughs> right we all work together like um off and on and then we, we don't know who we who we are <laughs> you know we i like i know everybody from instagram basically yeah. everybody's like yeah. i know their instagram tags before i know people's names <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> <Too true. laughs> oh. all right so i'll start with the first question and it is How did you get into pole dancing? What started that journey? Wow. Okay. So I touched my first pole when I was 19. So in, I don't even want to say the year, 2001 uh, (laughs) ish, 2002, maybe Uh, I I went and I showed a fake ID to a strip club. That's no longer in existence called Matthews in Tewksbury and went on stage for the first time and kind of fell in love with pole you know the stripping part was nice there was a guy I remember there was a customer there who like made origami out of his money so he was like making me little birds and stuff and I was like oh okay this could be like kind of a new career so I started there and then um started doing like uh the uh like contests all over the state so like amateur nights and then I was I was winning and I was like wow like like maybe I'm actually like not that bad at dancing and like particularly stripping. So I found a home club um, in 2004 uh, called Zachary's down the Cape and started uh, dancing there. It was nice. We were like, you know, had our own like stage show. It was three songs and I saw some of the performers there and I was like, I want to be like those girls. And so I was watching and learning for a long time. So I kind of had some background in pole. And then finally in like 2007, I went out to LA. I found a a pole dancing school in LA called B-Spun. And I saw the video of the the girl who owns it, Leanne, and she did a handspring. And I was like, oh my God, that's what I want to learn. So I flew out to California. I did my first pole class there. And I felt like kind of out of my element a little bit because everyone was in like, you know, it's LA and everyone was in like lingerie and like dressed up. And I was like, wow, this is like really, really intense. And I ended up loving it (laughs) and uh, flew back out there for for a few years afterwards. Um, So I went out to California for like two months and really tried to learn as much as I could basically to be a better stripper. And um, I came back to to my home club and like all of a sudden was like really good at the pole and women started coming in to see me and I had a woman come in who you know liked what I did and she was like I want you to come and teach me I will buy you an ex pole if you bring it to my house to teach me how to pole dance and I said okay fine so I did that it lasted about three weeks and I started traveling to her friend's houses and I was like I need to open up like a small space so I opened up um, a studio called Core Motion Pole Fitness that was in Hyannis in 2008. And I was open for about two and a half to three months and a pipe burst on New Year's Eve and flooded out my whole studio. Uh, so I settled with the insurance company. And the week I settled, I met the owner of the Gold's Gym on Lansdowne Street and told him like what had happened. He was like, oh, I have like a space that you can rent and like, let's try it out. So I went up there and I bought some more X poles. They were like the, not even the ones that are bolted in the ceiling. They were just the expert ones that you buy for home. Uh, I think I bought like seven or eight of them. And then he was like, you know, it'd be really cool. You should run a Groupon. And I was like, what's that? And he was like, oh, it's like a, you know, cool marketing tool. So I contacted Groupon. They were like, oh, you should, um, you need like reviews on Yelp. So I had my best friend and my sister write pole dancing reviews from my studio that had been in business for two weeks. They took me on Groupon. And at that time, Groupon used to only feature one business a day. So my business was featured as the only Groupon available for 24 hours. And I sold 1700 packages in one day. 
so I kind of like, you know, really opened up the market in Boston, which was, which was nice, but it was a blessing and a curse because I was a one person, you know, uh, business. And then all of a sudden I was book solid. So I was literally trying to find dancers and, and I found most of them in strip clubs. So I got a lot of strippers to come in, started teaching them how to teach and, you know, like fast forward 15 14 years later and here we are. So <laughs> I kind of fell into my lap, the teaching part, but um, I loved it. You know, it, it was good and bad because I wasn't able to really ever compete or be a performer um, on a professional level in that way, just because I was so busy teaching from the start that it was really hard for me to manage just the physical ability to train and teach. So it was something that I really never got a chance to do. Um, but people knew me, I think, from from the business, from Boston Pole Fitness. So that was kind of like, you know, where I ended up finding my niche. Rather than trying to build myself up as like a professional dancer, I tried to build my, my studio up as like, as the school, you know, so bypassing me and going right to the studios, which was kind of nice, you know. Yeah, you answered multiple questions at once. <laughs> right? <laughs> what a journey. That was, awesome. that was such a beautiful journey. Wow, incredible. I can't even believe it. And now, how many studios do you own? So now we have three. We have one in Newton, yeah. one in Malden, and one in Brighton. Uh, mostly because of COVID. You know, I had a, we had moved out of the Gold's Gym. Uh, about a year and a half after we got in there, I found a space in Brighton. Um, it took a, it was a lot of work. The the unit needed a lot of renovations. You know, I was very inexperienced at the time, so I did what I could. Uh, we didn't even have AC for like the first five years, um, and then uh, we slowly built it up. And then, unfortunately, with COVID, like I had to close down that location. It was just unmanageable. So uh, we initially downsized and you know, open Newton just to get people back in the door. I think a lot of students were a little reluctant to come back to pull because, you know, it's, you know, less clothing and there was a pandemic. So we really wanted to fill out the market. And then um, Brighton, the Brighton location, we were actually in negotiation with before COVID, we were looking to expand. So we kept we kept our uh, promise to go back to Brighton and then Malden kind of fell into our lap. So now we have have three, but um, the amount of pieces of equipment we have um, between all the studios, about 20. So it's not too bad. <laughs> right, and you have pole and aerials. Yeah, so um, our Newton location just has pole because we have wood beam structures. So with wood beams, it's always kind of funny when you're, yeah, when you're doing the, you know, anybody who builds out in like the first thing you look at for pole dancing schools is the ceiling. Uh, so wood beams are a little bit more tricky when it comes to aerial, especially like doing drops and stuff. Um, but Brighton uh, has Lyra and our Malden location is 17 foot ceiling. So we decided to put the silks in the Malden location to get that extra ceiling height. And we also have flying pole in Malden too. So uh, having the nice ceiling, it, the 17 foot ceilings are a blessing and a curse. Horrible for pole, great for aerial. Uh, working with Dexpole was a little difficult because they wouldn't, um, they don't sell spin poles over 15 feet, five inches. So we had to custom uh, extend the poles up to the height that we needed. So the install was a process. Um, but it's definitely worth it. Like the, the tall poles are fun. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I don't want to do a climb. <laughs> things you don't even think of. Like, I didn't even realize that they didn't make them over a certain height. I know. Yeah. So wow. yeah, our original, I know that. yeah, like, like our Brighton location actually did not have spin poles for a few years because when I had uh, moved out of the Gold's Gym and into Brighton, uh, the ceiling height was actually over 15 feet. And at that time, X pole wouldn't sell poles over 14 feet that would spin. So I had to go to Platinum Stages uh, and just buy the custom one piece poles that I had to cut per size for every. So I had to measure uh, where every pole was going because the ceiling was a little uneven. So we had to like measure every single pole to exact specifications and we didn't have the spin poles for some time. Um, so that was kind of like, it's always a nuisance sometimes with the higher ceilings, but now the, now the market's like obviously built so much more. People want the high ceilings and they're making poles like, like better quality, better materials. So now there's a little, little more uh, variable when it comes to the high ceilings, but 
sometimes you just run into issues. Yeah. And I think like insurance might, might be harder to find too. Cause I know for our insurance, it only covers like 12 feet and nothing above that, but luckily ours is 12 feet. Yeah. So I have a couple of different insurance policies. That's like the one thing that like, um, I was very adamant about. Um, we have, uh, like a regular insurance policy. It's like more for like, uh, gymnastics because they have the taller ceilings and they can do like the aerial. So we do fall under that. And then we also have another policy that, um, I looked into, which is for like performers. So like any instructor that comes in, we have like a performer's insurance that would cover any injuries with specifically people who come to teach for BPF. The students are always covered uh, with the liability policy. So we actually have two different types of insurance for that reason. Wow, so much to think about. You've really been through it from a water leakage to... I'm so sorry about the dogs. I think um, someone's watching that. I'm in, a house with, I'm in a house with three dogs. I'm surprised none of them are barking right now. So. I have three too. <laughs> but just to hear everything you went through, I'm just like, wow. And you still kept with it. And that's a that's a kudos to you. That's, I can't even imagine going through all that crap. <laughs> it was, it's been tough. The last couple of years, especially after COVID, were really tough. Um, just because one day you have an income and one day you don't, but you still are on the hook for all your liabilities. So, um, you know, during that time, I decided just to close and save, you know, whatever money I could um, and then reopen when Boston reopened. So we waited about seven or eight months before we started searching for the next location, just because I wanted to be sure that it was safe beforehand. So that was a struggle. That was definitely like, I took that time. I had to, you know, dig deep because I know what it's like to start a business. I know how much work it takes. And it's like, you put 10, 12 years into a business and you got to start over with the same amount of energy you had in your twenties, you know, and I'm almost 40 now. So it was, it was a adaption. Like, did you have any previous business experience or did you just were, were like, oh, here we go. Here's three studios uh, now. <laughs> no, well, uh, the build outs and stuff like that, I did have experience with at that point. So uh, I do not have a college education. I basically went out of high school and, and um, in high school, I graduated my license to cut hair because it was my fallback plan. You know, um, my mother died when I was 13. My dad is not in my life. So um, you know, stripping was kind of like the way for me to get ahead. And, um, you know, I wish I had taken some finance courses and business courses just to understand basic business instead of trial and error, because there were errors that cost me a lot of money. And especially after the Groupon happened, um, where I didn't know how to delegate the workload and really tried to take it on myself. So by the time I was 36, I had had like actually a nervous breakdown and went out to California for three days and didn't come home for six months because I was like so burnt out from every, from just working and building. Um, so that was tough, you know, but it's nice to come back with like a renewed energy to it. And um, like there are a lot of pole dancers that I know who own studios, you know, when we all started out, you know, 10 plus years ago who are now, you know, they're retiring and they're, you know, moving on to the next phase of their life. And I'm like just getting back in it. So as much as it kind of like was, uh, you know, it hurt me in a lot of ways, it really helped me to like step back and say okay you know is this actually my career am I am I gonna be like a pole dancer like in in like own studios and like do this and like be full in and you know part of me wishes that when the studios got going that I actually quit stripping but I was so afraid to lose that income and actually was afraid to believe in myself and believe in the business you know and that that took a lot that took 10 years for me you know just to believe that like the industry is like what it is now is it's amazing. Like I would have never pictured it to be so mainstream. I would have never pictured J Lo being on a pole for the Super Bowl in a million years, you know. Um, and so that really, like, really, like, renewed my faith in this industry for sure. Yeah. Well, I want to say being I so honest and sharing that. <laughs> yeah, like I admire you so much as a business owner, just because, like, I. I'm just a dancer. I have no business background either. And it's a struggle to own one studio. <laughs> I can't imagine like all of that that you go through and like, you're just so amazing. <laughs> Cause, um, you know, I think a lot of it was just plain old survival. You know, I, I lucked out getting the Gold's Gym location and then 
underestimated the market when I ran that Groupon, which it was good and bad because, you know, it showed that there was a market here. People, you know, want to pole dance. And so that was like, you know, that was definitely eye opening. But yeah, it was, you know, it's been challenged. Uh, like when COVID happened, I had just sold my house to renovate the Brighton location. So um, we had just completed our renovations one one month prior to the closings. And, you know, I didn't have any time to recoup that money. And I was basically living homeless for uh, almost almost a year and a half from that. So that was that was a challenge. But, you know, now it's getting better. And, you know, it's rebuilding. And, you know, I know a lot of uh, other studio owners kind of went through the same thing where all of a sudden they were like, Oh, my God, like, what do I do? Everybody went digital. And it almost felt like I was late to the game on that end because why, you know, when everybody's doing it now, there's so much static to fight through. So that kind of um, left a little bit of a damper, but that also gave me like a reason to want to reopen and say, you know, like, you know, I have something here. Boston Pole Fitness is, is the community. People want to come back, you know, and so it was nice to like kind of see that as well. So it's been, it's been a challenge, especially the last two years, but now I feel like, you know, PSO is coming back and like, you know, all of these, like, you know, people are like willing to travel again so you can get, um, you know, workshops going. So it's, you know, it's growing, it's growing. Yes, for sure. <laughs> I know, but hopefully, yeah, hopefully it'll stay in a more positive way because it, again, yeah. The struggle is not good. <laughs> uh, and I think a lot of a lot of it too is um, like for me, I found it that there weren't that many resources for small business owners in Boston. Um, how I ended up being able to expand with Brighton and um, and Malden so quickly was I when we did our Brighton build out, it was inside, we took a section of a Domino's and Domino's doesn't mess around. They have, they do union jobs. I mean, it's great because, you know, they really, you know, they pay top dollar for all of their gear and everything. But as a small business, I can't go in and turn a Domino's into a pole dancing school, which would require different zoning laws, different, uh, you know, sprinkler systems and, you know, a drainage system for bathrooms. And so a $50,000 build out just to, just to get, just to get ready to do my build out is tough. So Domino's took uh, the on the build out cost for us, which was like really, yeah, Boston Pie, I have to give them a shout out because they are like, they were so good to me. And I was in a, I was in a mess, frantic state as it was. So for them to put up with like, you know, me not knowing really much of anything and, you know, assisting me with the process has been really eye opening, um, especially when you're really trying to solidify a brand um, in Boston, you know, so uh, what they did was they linked me up with a, basically a gentleman who helps work with franchises. So um, that's something that like, I would like to maybe do at some point to help other other small business owners just to create that gap between like what the city requires and what what we actually need for the business. So because there's really no learning curve, there, there's just the learning curve, basically. And unfortunately, it costs a lot of money to learn where if you can have some sort of, um, you know, some sort of bridge there, I think it would it would save a lot of time, a lot of hassle and be able to help businesses. So I was lucky to kind of like shadow uh, from that person. And so that's been like, a, made the process a lot easier, but I definitely, my next goal would be to start, you know, uh, mentoring. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being that's willing awesome. to share what you know. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. If you have any questions, like anytime, let me know. Like the zoning and, and all that stuff is, the hardest part to deal with a lot of times is you're just dealing with these cities who really don't understand pole dancing. They think it's like a strip club thing. I remember uh, the first week I was open inside of the Gold's Gym and I had a guy from the health department walk in on me during a class and he basically said, oh, we got a complaint that there was nudity inside your studio. And I was like, oh my God, we're literally inside of a Gold's Gym. Like, no, I didn't even wear, have heels or anything like that. You know, we were very fitness. I called it Boston Pole Fitness, not Boston Pole Dancing for a reason. You know, I really wanted to make it fitness oriented, especially 
actually, it, you know, Massachusetts is a democratic state, but they're very conservative with a lot of things. And with pole dancing being so new, um, I did get a lot of pushback from people who were uncomfortable with pole dancing, uncomfortable with their wives pole dancing, you know. Um, so that was a, a little bit of a a little bit of an eye opener. Um, even as we were looking during COVID, uh, I had looked at a place in Lexington, Massachusetts, you know, it's like Lexington. And, um, and the woman was like really standoffish, very rude. You know, she ended up leasing it to another fitness studio, but then I opened up, yeah, like six months later. But when I opened up in Newton, she called me and said, oh, like, if you want to, you know, come back because I opened up in Newton's, like, that's the, just the type of industry it is. Those are the people that you deal with. And I was kind of upset, too, because I'm like, this is a woman who should be, like, empowering other women, like, business owners. And, that, like, I actually wrote her an email and was like, you know, like, women should be supporting each other in business, not trying to hold each other down. And, like, you know, I, I was like, and I basically told her, like, you know, if I was a core power yoga, you wouldn't have treated me this way. But because I'm a pole dancer, it's just, like, sometimes it's like an immediate brush off and uh, dealing with like a lot of like men builders, like the contractors and stuff has always been kind of difficult. I really try to like, um, it, it's sad, but like sometimes I have to watch like what I wear. Like I don't want to wear my pole dancing gear in front of these people, you know, because they judge and they make those comments and they make the jokes and every time it's, oh, can I come in and take a, can I come in and watch? You know, it's like, ugh. so I just tell them, just be the pole. <laughs> like what else are you gonna say you have to make those like you know like you have to like make those jokes and like brush it off and it's 2022 and we're still doing that you know it's crazy we sure are <laughs> <laughs> you know it's so annoying like maybe one day people will understand it's, i look at all of that as teachable moments mm -hmm. they're all teachable moments you know like it's a fitness, it's an exercise. And hey, yeah, we have men who pole dance. We have male instructors actually. Come and take a class, find out, you know. Um, there are some people who become genuinely interested in it, which is nice. Um, you know, it's it's like anything. It's it's new, it's still sort of new, especially like going into like the Malden area where like it was, you know, kind of, you know, where the you know, there's North Shore, but they're a little bit further away. So Malden was still kind of a new territory. And, you know, a lot of the builders that I dealt with, like, just didn't, they didn't get it, you know, they didn't get it, but now they're seeing it. And they're like, oh, this is actually like, kind of cool. I mean, having the squire right down the street didn't help. So <laughs> they were like, oh, you training people for the squire? I was like, maybe. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, so, I used right? to work like Right, like <laughs> we we are, yes. Yeah. <laughs> training them for training people for whatever they want to do with pole. I'm just glad they're coming yeah. in. Exactly. <laughs> right, like we get we get a lot of that out here too, and in, in Springfield, and but I can't imagine because you you introduce it to Boston, which is this big city. <laughs> like I can't even imagine the different types of experiences you must have had. Yeah, I mean. Coming from the stripper background actually made, made it a little bit harder because people who knew me as a dancer and I was currently dancing at, um, when I was building up the business. So, and I was young, you know, and I think that like, I got taken advantage of a lot. I think a lot of people didn't take me seriously. And, you know, looking back on it, I realized it at that time, I just dealt with it, you know, because it was like, Oh, just a stripper, you know, trying to open up a pole dancing school sort of thing. Oh, ha ha ha. This is so cute. And, you know, now fast forward 15 years later and it's everywhere, <laughs> which is great, you know? And I think a lot of, um, you know, you have to give kind of credit to like the circus industry too, bringing pole dancers and like and Ariel together. I think that really like really um, helped create, like helped diminish that gap that was there and looked at, helped pole dancing become like more mainstream for sure. Yeah. Can't wait to see what happens in another 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> I hope my back, you know, I hope I'm like able to get on a pole in 15 years, you know? I know, me too. <laughs> It's cool. Well, it's I'll like be there. Now being like almost I'm turning 40 this year. So I'm having like a whole thing with it. 
Well, it's, it's good and bad. Like I feel, I feel really like honored that I'm still able to do what I do at 40. And most of that is from the poll. When I took that, um, that six month hiatus, um, I also took time after that and stopped dancing and then COVID happened. So when I had to come back and teach after COVID, I had been almost three years off a poll, um, where I was, and by that, I mean, not, not teaching and not really doing, you know, doing poll every week. So, it was, it was eye-opening, like how much my body had changed in that three years. And also like what would take me normally three or four months to get back and get those moves back has taken me almost over a year for some of these moves. So, you know, I have to, I've noticed like, you know, as my body's getting older, I have to be a little more gentle on the pull. Um, but I find that like, it actually has helped me become a better teacher, especially for um, those who are a little bit older, you know, and want to come in and not, maybe not their goals aren't to, you know, do a fonji. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's definitely um, helped me like relate better to, to different people too. Um, just in terms of like my teaching ability. So when you feel it, then you'll like, then you can learn it a lot more too. Like when you start to feel those, those changes and those pullers who've been doing it for like 10 plus years know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so true. <laughs> uh, well, I hope, you know, like polar, cause I, I just turned 41, but pullers like us will what? be no. good role models for everyone else. You can pull at any age <laughs> and we have a lot of yeah. students too that are, that are older. Um, you know, so it's just, I laugh though, like we'll, we'll be called grandmaster in a PSO. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm like, oh my God, I see all these things now. It's great. I think it's because too, like a lot of the, a lot of the people who started polling, you know, 10, 15 years ago, were in their 20s. We were all in our 20s, you know, and now we've kind of like grown with the industry a little bit. So now you have this whole other age bracket that still wants to pole dance. Like in our Brighton location, it was always kind of, it, the age always kind of stayed the same because it's college town. So, you know, my joke was, I always used to say, oh, I teach 20 year old, you know, 20 year old people how to pole dance. And they're like, you know, I, like dream job for some people, you know, but the age bracket has always remained consistent because of the college students. But now to like get into Newton and Malden where you have more people who are over college age coming in. Um, I've definitely seen like a growth in the market from that, which is like, it's great, you know, and it's like, it's a new you know, it's, it's something fun to do and it's different. And you know what? Boston needs it. Boston needs some fun stuff right now. They're, you know, been in a slump for a little while. So to have these outlets and create communities, especially like communities around Boston, but also like communities in New England and international, like there, you know, you can literally just be pole famous and travel around the world, like as a pole dancer, you know, it's so cool. Like when I go to a new city, the first thing I do is check out a pole studio just cause I know I'll make friends, you know? So it's so nice to like have that, you know, in common with, with other people. And now that it's like all over the world, it's just amazing. It truly is. I can't wait to see what happens. No, right? Yeah. It's like every year the PSO gets bigger and bigger and these like, and now I'm seeing a lot of like um, local theater really doing pole performances now. I've seen like, that's kind of like the next thing, like, you know, uh, doing these productions, which is awesome. Um, that was like one of my original goals, having the original, having the Brighton location uh, before I closed it was we had to actually put a stage in. And we're ready to start doing shows. Oh, it's the worst feeling, like having to shut that down. But it is what it is. But you know, there's, um, you know, there's definitely, you know, a community happening there. Where now there's like, so there's this bridge with pole and like circus, and now there's this bridge with pole and theater, which is coming in. And I see it like just expanding on so many different levels. That there's so much opportunity out there. And I think, um, like dealing with you know, my BPF people and my BPF staff, um, you know, my goal is to help them create uh, branding and also like, also to create like a business without having to just physically work because you have to be able to make money in this industry without constantly killing yourself. And how do you do that in an industry that's so physical and so physically demanding? So opening up, uh, 
you know, different sectors and allowing pole to, to cross over with these different industries, I think is a great way for people to start being able to make careers out of pole dancing without actually having to physically pole dance so much, which I think is also important. Right, yeah, there's so many aspects of the pole world. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to thank you too for for bringing so many um different pole artists to to our area because you just have so many workshops going on and <laughs> they're all so amazing and it, it you know it makes it um possible for us to take from different teachers from all around the world basically and <laughs> oh, yeah I mean, that's kind of honestly what I've been looking for when I scout for um, like workshops and stuff is performers. Uh, so I'm lucky enough that my partner lives in Brooklyn. So I go to a, like stick a pole in it and uh, Secret Loft and all of these places that have these pole shows going on almost on a weekly basis. So um, a lot of the a lot of the pole performers that I see, that's like kind of how I'm like, oh, that person's awesome. Like we need to bring them to Boston. Like you know, and we need it, you know, it's nice to like be able to have people in different parts of the country and, and all over the world teach pole because uh, pole's not as standardized as, you know, other industries. And, you know, it's a work in progress, of course, you know, like having the expo certifications was definitely one of those one of those great things that happened to pull to be able to sort of standardize at least the teaching portion. Um, but for every studio, they always have their own style. I personally love that. I love that each studio kind of like finds its own flavor. I mean, I owned a, um, a studio in Providence as well. I own Providence Pole Fitness. I uh, opened it shortly after Boston Pole Fitness and then sold it in 2017 when I, um, it was just too much like with the traveling and everything. But I noticed like the markets were different in two, you know, two different cities, completely different market, completely different clientele. So I think like, you know, not having a standardization is actually a good thing because then it allows you to kind of cater to the area that you're in rather than trying to, you know, make a, you know, a, you know, a round peg fit into a square box. And, you know, so, and everyone kind of learns at their own pace. Um, when I had first opened my studios, I had this, you know, big group on that happened. And one of the challenges I found was how do I teach all beginners all at different fitness levels. I've had people walk in my door who haven't been to a gym in five years and I've had gymnasts, you know? And so how do you create a practice that it allows everyone to feel included, but also allows, allows those to grow at their own pace? So um, I developed the progression method, which is what I, I coined the phrase progression. And I actually had initially wanted to call my studios progression studios, but Google search made it so much easier to call it like Boston Pole Fitness and Providence Pole Fitness. So um, I kept that um, instead, but I always kept progression in my mind because it was a method of teaching where you could teach a move and allow those who needed more time to, to have more time you know, learning those moves and then allow those that, you know, had a little bit more of the dancer or fitness background to move up a little quicker. So that's why I remember when I had first opened my studios, um, most pole dancing schools taught series, which was like a six week series for like $200. I didn't want to do that because I didn't know really how to teach how to guarantee that everybody's gonna be able to invert in six weeks. Like I can't make that guarantee, you know? So I felt like doing the drop-in style classes and having like, you know, 101 and climb clinic and all was a better, was a better fit and it worked. And I remember one of my first instructors when I told her I wanted to do that, she called me crazy. She was like, it's never gonna work. And I was like, let's just try it. And it took off and then it, became kind of like the standard I know in Boston to kind of teach that way where the series kind of phased out and it, and it was more about allowing people to uh, learn at their own pace. Plus, I hope that people would take pole for longer than six weeks, you know, so it was like a way to keep people coming in past that time and keep them excited about, you know, coming in and, and being able to progress, especially at your own pace too. That's so, so important because I am a slow learner. Like, the moves that the moves that 
people are doing now, I'm like, okay, that's like five years, <laughs> five years away. Some of the stuff is a little, it's awesome. It's awesome. I prefer to, um, to teach rather than to be a performer at this point in my life. So how I teach is, is actually like where I want to strive as a pole dancer rather than my skills, my personal skills. But um, I think it's like, you know, there are obviously students who want to come in and they want to, you know, be champions and I'm all about that. So learning how to teach properly, I think is also, uh, you know, is also needed in this industry, especially an industry that's very not standardized in a lot of ways. It's so true what you say. And speaking of moves, you mentioned how now there are moves that are like there are five, that, that's five years away from me. I'm glad you're honest that we all need to be honest with that. Um, but um, speaking of moves, since you said that, what is your, I'm curious to know, what is your favorite pole move and what is your pole nemesis? Because I know you took that hiatus. My pole so nemesis. Oh my God. My pole nemesis is definitely the Phoenix. Um, um, I just, even when I was in the best shape, it was still just hard for me. I think it's, um, just a matter of the momentum, uh, moves that require a lot of momentum. I'm not very good with because I need to be able to do them slow. <laughs> and if I can't do it slow, then I can't do it. So, um, and I'm kind of a baby in that way where, um, if I have to catch myself, in, you know, flying upwards. It's just, it's been tough for me. Uh, I'm still practicing it. Maybe one day I'll get it. And then I'll, when I get it, I'm definitely performing it though. I'll tell you that much. Uh, <laughs> and then one of my favorite moves was actually like, I had a couple of like signature moves at the club. I called them like my moneymaker moves. Um, the first one was I went into a basic inverted V, but then put my feet up on the ceiling. And I, I used to call it the Spider-Man because it didn't have a name at the time. So that one was always really fun and got, it made money. So I liked it. Um, and then another move that's kind of one of my favorites actually, and I teach it all the time. And uh, I love it for a few reasons. I love it for the conditioning value. I love it that um, it's one of the first inversions that I teach um, and it's a moneymaker move and you can have so much flavor with it. And that's the elbow stand. I love it. I think it's like one of the best tools to uh, train, uh, develop like conditioning strength, especially like in the core where you want to have students who are trying to invert, you know, standing up and they need to work on their balance. Um, and it also gives you the feeling of being upside down without being completely off the floor and everything that comes with that, like the blood rushing to your head, maybe you're getting dizzy or distorted. So it's a good way to practice. Um, it's also the move that I got my big, my biggest injury with because I was like, oh my God, it's an elbow stand. It's like, I can do this a million times and over directed my body and, uh, pulled a muscle in my back really, really horribly uh, for about six months. So even though the move might seem a little bit more novice to some, it was actually the move that gave me, I would love to say that, oh yeah, like I injured myself flying in a Phoenix, but that wasn't it. It was in the elbow stand. Um, but again, love, love that. One of my favorites. And there's so much flavor you can add with that. Um, so that's, those are my two, I guess. I love that. Thank you for sharing it. <laughs> I can't wait to see you perform those genetics when you get that. That is going to be fun. <laughs> okay. Well, now I have to like get on the ball. So, <laughs> well, we're going to try to be in this for years. I can't it's wait. It's like to see one it of those moves. Road. You literally, you literally have to try. You have to practice it at least three times a week, in my opinion. Because if I try it like once a month, then I'm like not really making any progress. I'm like, I need to at least practice it like three times a week. So I can, and I, I remember when, I remember seeing the Phoenix for the first time and it was Alethea Austin who did it. And she did it in a video and she did a video actually on how to, um, how to kind of achieve the Phoenix. And she, her thing was try it three times and then walk away because you don't even know how much your body is really working. And so you, that fourth time you're going to be exhausted. So it was always like taking those breaks were important, but you know, you just can't, I can't take six months break. I have to like, you know, have to wait six days maybe but one day i'll do it now you now now i'm put on the spot so i have to learn it good for you for <laughs> doing it three times i tried it once i was like nope never touched it again <laughs> no, no, no. I, practiced, I practiced it three times, and then i walked away for like five months <laughs> <laughs> 
And are we doing the cup grip or the twisted grip? Uh, or... So I was learning it with the twisted grip, but then I went and took a workshop with actually Samantha Starr recently. And she was showing me like a hand over hand way, like from a spin to do it. I have a video of it, so I would have to review it to like tell you in specifics. But yeah, talk to Samantha Starr and she will... Um, She'll tell you how to do it. <laughs> I was like, I literally did it, the hand over hand spin. And I was like, wow, I might be able to get a Phoenix one day. <laughs> Sounds so amazing and so far away from me. <laughs> well, we have to get her to come. We'll do a work. We'll do some workshops again. And we've coordinated workshops before. So um, yeah, we had a, well, I mean, that's the best part is that if you can get like a big pole star to come here, there's three or four studios they can yeah. they can travel to which is like it's it's worth it because sometimes bringing pole stars just gets so pricey you know um which they deserve they do, i wish you know i think everybody should be should be paid well you know but it's always a balance um you know trying to bring people in and, and making sure that we have enough enough interest and then also like a lot of um you know a lot of workshops are high level which is like sometimes you've got to get um like people to come in to kind of like bring it down a notch so that more people can be included. A lot of the high level workshops that we do are mostly for the instructors. I feel like it's a lot of people who teach who want to come in and do that. So, but there, you know, obviously we need that end of it too. So it's always, again, balance with everything, you know, finding out what works, you know, on a, on a, on a broader, you know, income scale and then finding out what's needed. I know yeah, it's and awesome. I, All right. I, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, it's okay. Oh, <laughs> you can go. I was going to say, as, as an instructor who um, you graciously hosted, I know it was uh, it feels awesome to be invited and be able to teach in other places, and it really does mean a lot. So the fact that you do that with post stars, hopefully up and coming post stars, like yeah, no, you guys are other instructors, is it's truly beautiful. It does it really does mean a lot. Oh yeah, definitely. And you know what, what's nice too um, is like I've noticed that like over the years the um, industry has changed in a little a little differently just because now it is more about like that Instagram. You know, it's I mean pole dancing is a visual art. Why wouldn't it be about Instagram? I love it. But what's really nice is that now like uh, having this community, specifically in Boston, where you know I can definitely comment on um it's nice to have people come and they're building up their platforms you know like when when we feature like new instructors we're featuring it to thirteen thousand followers so um you know i love being able to have that you know in the market because i feel like that's something that we offer you know especially boss pool fitness it's like oh want to have chris come hell yeah we'll come on down and then we get to advertise for you. So yeah, like, um, and part of, part of my, um, I kind of feel, feel like I failed pole dancing in a lot of ways because when I did have that breakdown, um, you know, I built up these studios and really didn't even have the opportunity to bridge with other studios because I was barely holding on. And so now I am like, I feel really like grateful that I can now start to do that. And I'm not so hyper-focused on just teaching and trying to like play catch up with, with, you know, all of these coupons and just trying to like learn the system, you know, and learn this whole industry. Um, so now it's nice to be able to step back and, and have that opportunity to give to people, because I really feel like that was one of my, that was one of my early failures was not making those, those connections with other people doing the same thing I was doing. And it wasn't, you know, malicious. It was just that I was barely holding on. <laughs> Don't feel bad. Sure yeah. 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 Oftentimes oftentimes things like that happen and people don't realize the stuff that it's doing to us um and they take it one way and they assume something completely different and it's when you share it it shows that we're all human and we're all the same and we're all going through it yes and all we can do is like go forward and do our best so here we are <laughs> um, that's why I was so yeah. excited to do this podcast because I like never really I feel like I don't get to interact with people outside of my studio so much just because um you know my focus just I hyper focus I have ADHD and I'm like 
I need to focus on this project and then I ignore everything else that's needed. So um, that's why I was really like so gracious for you to like have me on here and because it was like just such an opportunity to connect with other studio owners that I just don't get a chance to do as often. And uh, we should definitely do like some sort of group or like maybe there maybe there's already one, but I would love to have something going in New England to like be able to bridge all the studios and say, oh yeah, like let's, you know, all collab and do our, you know, do our own performances and, and be able to bring, I want that. So anytime you guys want to do it. Oh my God, I love that. We've been <laughs> that talking cool. about performances. <laughs> that's all we've been talking about. We want your set stage. Let's make it go back. <laughs> I have, I'm working on a few locations that um, that might be able to do something on a regular basis. I was lucky enough that like when I was when I was training in LA, my instructor was doing it was called Pull Show LA, and it was like the coolest thing. Yeah. So and it was like the first time you got to like really train with a lot of like really like high high level pull stars. So like you know Janine Butterfly and Natasha Wang and all of these names like came from this like one show. It was the it was that or the US PDF. But for me, I personally like the opportunity to perform rather than compete. Um, I love the competitive circuit because I think there's definitely like a need for that and it harbors a lot of talent. But I would love to be able, yeah, we definitely need like another review or something. We have to like, we need a theater. We need to find somebody. If anybody is out there listening who owns a theater, who wants to donate space to pole dancers, we would accept it. <laughs> love it. We would yeah, all we accept it, Cirque. please. For the next Cirque du Soleil, Cirque the Pole. <laughs> Ole. Travel around. <laughs> It would be nice. There's a lot of, um, you know, and like I see the performance opportunity that's happening in New York and I would love to bring a piece of it to Boston. Yeah. Yes. Definitely, and there's so much talent here. And then everyone, yes. I feel like um, when I was, uh, uh, some of the struggles I had was actually losing talent to New York. You know, I never, you know, I never wanted to hold any of my instructors back, but it was always tough to see like really good instructors move on, but that's where it is. And, you know, it's kind of, how do you compete with that? We have to build it. I never even thought about that. Wow. That, that must be tough. Yeah. Well, you know, it's part of the industry and, you know, New York or anybody really, I mean, it would be nice to like have, you know, you don't want, you don't want to hold people back, basically. And so I always wish, it always sucked for, for BPF because it was like, ah, oh, you know, but I always like was so happy from BPF and also like solidified my studio as like a really good place to get your start, yeah. you know? So, um, you know, I'm very proud of that, that like, you know, we had a lot of, lot of talent come through our doors and it's funny too, because there's like a, couple of like group chats that I'm on with like some OG BPF people and it's like Samantha Starr and Amy Bond and like I'm like oh my god it's like some of these girls like went on to huge huge careers and it's it's amazing all because of you well yeah. because of the studio <laughs> because of the studio for, for sure it was nice and it's nice to like still like there's those OGs and we like still all like kind of stay in touch it's it's cute it's definitely like, yeah. it feels like a family for real. I love that. <laughs> well, um, so, you say you have three okay. studios now. Do you have any plans for uh, the future to open anything else besides the stage where we can all perform? <laughs> I was going to say besides yeah, the actually, theater. <laughs> Um, I've started, I've started scouting, uh, a fourth location, um, right now, you know, it's, it's kind of a weird time, especially in the Boston area where things are very expensive. So I would love to be able to get a space that's big enough for my needs without having to overextend what I can afford. And that's a big fear of mine. Um, even like, you know, the average cost of my leases is like over $4,000 and it's, like scary to write that check, write those checks every month. Like these are numbers that I've never dreamed, you know, I would be working with, but also like, it's a big fear, you know, that's kept me back is, you know, the money side of it, because, uh, you know, just not having that second income anymore really, um, 
really is, is a challenge for me. I mean, BPF is amazing, but I'm like, oh, should I go back to stripping? <laughs> like maybe one day, but, uh, you know, so right now I, it's just a matter of like Boston's very expensive and there's a lot of stuff going on in the city, um, especially with some of these buildings where they're older, they don't have the ceiling height we need. It's like the wood beams are falling down and it's complete overhaul renovations. So, um, you know, it's just not as much space here as in like, you know, even going outside the city, which is why Malden was so great because it's outside of Boston. It's close to Boston, but outside of Boston, but you know, it's a new, new building. And so you get like the new beams and those are like the best. <laughs> so uh, Boston's kind of tough, but we are looking, it's going to take, I think it's going to take a little bit of time to find that, that right location. I, um, so we'll see. So right now, uh, the goal is to like start the productions and get into that side of it. So we'll, we'll start making some announcements in the next month or two, right around PSO. And then I would love to like, again, invite like you guys to come and perform. I think it would be, oh, we could have a pole in the wall, like whole like debut. I would love it. Um, uh, yeah. So we'll, I'll connect more. And again, that gives me a reason to connect more with the studio owners to bring them in and say, hey, listen, we want to do this production. Um, going honestly, going to Burning Man was a big help for that because um, I was learning like just a lot of project management skills and like just the building in general. We build these like big geometric domes. There's a lot of rigging involved. So now I'm like getting more comfortable with that. And like, it's funny. I always think about like what's some advice I could give to people and you know, one of the biggest pieces of advice, I think, is to you have to learn to do every job yourself. Um, so like with rigging, particularly where I'm not, that's not my strong suit um, and I'm learning, uh, because if not, then you're kind of like dependent on other people. And it's not a bad thing, but it's also um, kind of a disadvantage where like if you need somebody to come in and fix something, now you're at the whim of when they're able to come in. And so that's um, been a challenge, you know, a lot. Um, just finding, you know, just with different locations and dealing with it. If you're like, whenever I go into a new location, the first thing I look at is the ceiling. And I'm like, what am I working with? <laughs> Damn, and you just learned everything. And now you're just good at everything. I'm, I'm so <laughs> in awe of you. Like, I, I just can't believe like, you just took all that and you went with it. And, and I mean, like, I know you talk about there was some struggles and everything, but all I see is success. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> I mean, and I, I know I've come to you for, for a little bit of advice too. We tried to get, you know, workshop people and I, and I was struggled yeah. with trying to find like budgeting and you helped me out with that. So I just so appreciate so it. Tough, you know, because it's a, it's a, it's a risk for every business, you know, um, it's tough because like for me, I find a big challenge for my business right now is I want to keep my prices down. You know, I want to, and I actually have gotten a lot of slack from that, from other, from other people in this industry, because they say I'm too cheap and I'm bringing the whole market down. But for me, I look at it as if somebody wants to pay $45 for a class, then they have the right to do that. But why not allow people to come to poll because they can't afford it? I've always tried to at least make it open for as many people as possible. And, you know, even for me coming from a background, um, you know, struggling financially, you know, I never, I was closed off to a lot of opportunities. I wanted dance classes and such because I couldn't afford it. So that's been um, a little bit of a struggle, but then also like being able to bring in top tier talent at a price that people can afford is also been a little bit, um, you know, but people have worked with us. It's great. You know, it's nice to have, you know, and being able to offer multiple studios when, when, uh, you know, pr pro athletes come in is always an advantage to keep the prices a little bit lower so that more people can take the class. Um, so that's been, that's definitely been a challenge for the studio. Um, because I want, I want everyone to be able to pull, you know, I wish, I wish I could do it you know, on a sliding scale, it's maybe at some point in the near future where we could do something like that um, and make the business model work so that people can come in. You know, we offer like 
uh, exchange opportunity, a lot of exchange opportunities, just so in, you know, some people just, they want to come in and take the classes. And, you know, I've had students who can't afford it. I'm just like, you know, just come, just come, come in, we'll figure it out, you know, because uh, during those times, the crisis is usually when they need the community the most. And so it's important to like, be there, you know, for, for the students and for people who just need to feel safe. I'm really glad that you say that because I, um, you know, I see that too. And like, I didn't, you know, it's, it's a stress relief for so many people. And like the way that you see, like how poll changes people, you, you have to make it available. Like, it's like, <laughs> I, I feel that too. Yeah. It also has to be sustainable too. Yeah. You know, um, the, the challenge for me, um, especially after COVID was that because I had sold my house, I didn't have any, I, it was good. I didn't have any living expenses. It was bad because um, I didn't have a place to live and I was trying to build, I literally lived out of the Newton basement for almost four months just to be able to get it off the ground, you know, um, and make it sustainable again. So, um, but, you know, like that's the sacrifices that owners, you know, owners make. And, you know, I, I knew that it was bigger than me. I just had to get it going. You know, you do what you can keep, keep it going. And now hopefully, you know, you'll get rewarded in the end. And I feel like, you know, very, very, you know, I, I like just have like so much gratitude for the BPF community. And really I, all I did was build, I built and that's it. Like the BPF community is really run by the people who are there. Um, and they are so into it and that like really like renewed my faith, like in, in my business and in the industry itself that like, you know what, this is needed. Like people need this outlet. They need to get away. They need to just feel like they can come in and be themselves for that hour and, you know, release a day or maybe even just chat and like, you know, like talk to your friends about whatever struggles are going on. So, um, it's like the community is really like what makes it now. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> um, did you have any? Do you have any time to do anything else in your free uh, time? <laughs> I've been like I've been on this. Um, so for me, because I I'm I hyper focus. So like, um, the whole summer was really just working. Um, and so now I've, I'm on my little bit of a break uh, through the middle of September, and then when I come back, it's like getting through the PSO, and then we want to um try to get our showcase in so that I'll talk to you more about that off air. And, um, so I, I take, I make the time, you know, even during the week, like my mornings, are, I have my rituals, you know, you have to just, especially doing something very physical, you just have to like get into that right mindset. Um, so I've been, you know, just stingent coming from, you know, a little bit more strict with like my diet and just like being careful about my, my choices, you know, do I go out with, you know, for that beer or do I need to teach a class in the morning? So that's been um, a little bit more, but then, you know what, you go to Burning Man for two weeks and you let it all out and then you come back and you're ready to work again. So it's not too, too bad. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's work, you know, just like anything else, but I love it. And I think like being able to have, being a business owner has been amazing. Like I, especially now that I've learned a little bit more, like now, like I'm like, oh, I own a business instead of being like, oh my God, I own a business. I have to do this, this, and this. I'm like excited about my problems. I'm like, wow, I get to make like really like creative decisions and allow other people to be creative. And like, I'm opening doors for a lot of, you know, people who come through and like, I really love that. And then some days I dream about bagging groceries. So <laughs> like, I just want to do something like wash dishes and not have to think anymore, but um, you know, so it's a balance, but yeah, it's been a, you know, it's been a struggle. One of the biggest struggles for me, and I do talk about this a lot is that um, I was a, I was addicted to drugs for the first eight years that I was teaching. I was taking Percocets on a daily basis. So um, to come back to pull and, you know, not have that was definitely a challenge. And I think that's why making the, the creating the community has been so much more important because I need that. I need that strength to say, you know what, I'm going to get through my day and not want to get high. And the triggers that are going on in my life, you know what, they melt away when I, hold on to that chrome 
and I can like just not have to think about anything except for the way that I move and how good it makes me feel. Thank you for sharing that. I feel many, for some reason, pole dancers come from an addiction background. And it's so important that we share that connection because it does happen. Um, I have an addiction history and I know many others who have. Um, and pole dancing saves lives. So thank you it so does. much for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, creating a safe space to, to be able to share is important. You know, um, that's why I've been a little bit more open with it. You know, I was very private about my addiction for a very long time and it served me no purpose other than just trying to hide it. And so now I feel like, you know, it's important to share so that people know that like, there's no judgment in pole unless you're competing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're all here for each other. We're all here, you know, we all have our, you know, little bit of, you know, differences and what whatever have you but we're all here for the common you know the common entity which is pull and you know everything else can melt away it sure can it sure can <laughs> i love your nails we, by the way thank you <laughs> i just did them and it was joe and yeah, I messed them up because gel is awful. <laughs> I love the gel though if you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Are they hot pink? Like pink and a black. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I guess that, that's some self care. Do you have any like self care things you want to share with? Um, with yeah, it, it was funny. So, well, not funny, but. When COVID had happened, I was in a very, very dark place. And I um, am lucky enough to be involved with uh, shamanic healers. And I spent a half a summer in Pennsylvania at a basically a shamanic retreat that helped me really get into the, really get into the zone to be able to reopen because I didn't, wasn't sure if I wanted to anymore. And I really had to find a lot of mental strength um, to be confident enough to approach this business again from a new angle and also um, get over my shit. You know, the, the traumas that, you know, caused me to be a drug addict were not going away and they weren't gonna go away whether I opened a studio or not. And I can't open another studio if I'm dealing with not dealing with my, you know, my shit that happened 20 years ago. <laughs> so um, I, um, I do a lot of like meditation. I do Reiki. I um, do, um, I go to uh, power animal ceremonies in New York, which is uh, basically a meditative drumming that helps you connect with different uh, spirit animals. So mine is a shark, which I kind of feel like a shark because I'm always like trying to look for the, the next, you know, the next thing that's going to happen and pull. And so I'm kind of feeling those like hunter vibes, you know? Um, so that's been helping a lot, you know, and just really taking those few minutes to um, assess how I'm feeling sometimes, you know, in different situations and trying not to react and actually becoming a patient, you know? And that's been you know, for me who wants to be ADHD, go, go, go. I can't sit down all the time to like sit back and say, okay, I shouldn't make a decision because I'm feeling this way. Let's take a day and think about it and allowing, you know, my head to process, you know, a decision or whatever have you. So um, that's just been something that I've been practicing. That's been very, very helpful. Um, and especially not reacting to my emotions so much, which um, has also been beneficial. So, uh, you know, it's just been, it's been a progress of trying to just take a step back every day and assess what's going on in my life instead of reacting and saying, oh my God, this thing's making me upset. Oh, you know, five years ago, I'd be going for a Percocet to drown that feeling. And now I need to process it. So, taking, you know, those runs 
or doing the power animal ceremonies or just like my morning of just like having a cup of coffee and making it, you know, and taking that time to like reflect on what's happening in my life has been very, very helpful. And thank you so much for sharing those tips and also for being, you know, so transparent about your story and, and everything because it's very relatable. And like the whole time you're just talking, I'm like, wow, this is exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just really Sorry. like validating. Um, so yeah. thank you. It's, yeah, yeah. You know, because sometimes people just see the business and they don't really yeah. know. Like, I'm kind of more of a private person. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't same. post a lot of poll videos and stuff just because. Um, well, I just. I don't know. When I learned, it wasn't all about poll videos, you know, it was like about finding inner, you know, self-care and like, you know, your inner, you know, beauty and all that. And so my, my Brighton studio didn't even have mirrors for like three years because it was about finding, you know, like inner, inner beauty and not just looking in the mirror all the time. Plus I found that it was a lot easier to teach without mirrors because mirrors throw off balance when you're trying to do a Phoenix. And, um, and so like, if you have students who are constantly looking in the mirror, that's something to look out for when you're teaching. Um, so that was, yeah, it was just a lot of, you know, a lot of practice basically. And it's been, you know, it's been a journey for real, but my, um, you know, I live my life kind of separate from the business and I try to keep, keep that separation mostly because I think, cause when I was a stripper, you literally live the stripper lifestyle and you, it kind of becomes a part of you in some way because you're selling a certain lifestyle to people. So you have, and they see you outside of that. They'll see you, you know, on the street or whatever. And I would run into customers and whatever. You kind of always had to put on that front. That's why you have that alter ego that happens. And then sometimes it like just becomes a part of you. And it got to the point where it just, I wanted to be me. And that alter, alter ego made me you know, it wasn't who, it was what I did, not who I was. So I think, you know, creating that separation for me has been nice, but it's also been kind of, you know, people see things that are happening in Boston Pole Fitness and then sometimes don't understand the behind the scenes and they just kind of see this like, oh, it's BPR for whatever. And, you know, and they, they kind of don't understand how much work was actually put in. And, you know, I don't want to mislead anybody as to how much work you know, as you know, like owning is owning a business is it's, it's a lot, you know, and so uh, it's nice to be able to share my story. And hopefully that like allows others to feel comfortable and be able to share I want to hear everybody's stories, you know, um, but also, um, also helps those understand what it what really takes to run a business, because it, it is not just, you know, financial, it's emotional. It really is. <laughs> I just that. <laughs> it's like end of days where you're like, I just want to cry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but then also you're the, on the other hand, like you said before, like you get to spend every day, like changing people's lives and like doing what you love. So it's, exactly. it's exactly. Yeah. It's a give and take of the amount of, you know, the amount of stress and pressure you can feel, but also like the fact that, you know, I'm really grateful I don't have to sit in a cubicle, you know, and I can, <laughs> I, can, I can offer the space for people who sit in a cubicle to be able to move around and like, you know, expel that energy as well, because I feel that. I mean, I was lucky enough when I was in high school, my guidance counselor was like, you're never going to sit at a desk. <laughs> way too hyperactive for that but um yeah you know it's nice to be able to offer that for people who you know don't get the opportunity to do things that are as physical on the other hand too it's nice but it's also physical you know and you know you get those pains and you know and you wonder if it's gonna last and you know can do I have to take a break and can I afford to take a break and oh my god you know like it's those are the stresses that come, you know, especially in this industry too. You know, the worry of injury is m one of my biggest worries at all, all the time. There were things I didn't do. I didn't want to learn to ski because I was afraid I would get injured and not be able to pole dance, you know? So um, there's that end of it too, where you kind of like cost and value your risk level for things, um, you know? So it's, it's always something that like, 
you know, you have to keep in mind when when owning a business or even when having a physical, a career that's physically demanding, such as, you know, and pole is very, I think one of the more aggressive styles of aerial out there. Um, I find that like a lot of aerialists who come to pole, they like it, but they don't love it. Where a lot of pole dancers go to aerial and they're like, oh my God, this is so easy. What the silks wrap around. I don't have to reach overreach for a pole like oh it comes to me this is great you know and so I find that like a lot of pole dancers like who move over move on to aerial thrive in aerial just because they had to learn on the pole food for thought I'm dying to try other aerial apparatus <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so I was thinking about um because you and I were both we're both the same age and, and we were both stripping at the same time. And whenever students ask me stories about my stripping days, I always laugh because it was before the age of cell phones. Oh, and yeah. like, <laughs> and I finally have someone to talk to about this because I can't even imagine what it's like to have a cell phone in the strip club right now. Like I would not like that. We started getting cell phones like towards the end. I stopped dancing like officially in 2019. Uh, or 2000, end of 2018. Um, so I stopped kind of dancing uh, officially then. So we started getting the phones like towards the end. I would just take people's phones and smash them. I mean, I wouldn't care. I'd, what are they going to do? Fire me? Go ahead. Uh, so, but I was lucky, like the club that I worked at, like I, I mean, I didn't really care if guys filmed me because I was like, my, my big joke to everyone was like, literally thousands of people have seen my pussy. So, I mean, there's that too. So that's part of being a dancer. You kind of live with that for the rest of your life, you know? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I remember this one, guy, this one guy used to come in. He was from Florida. This is like one of the funniest things. And he used to dip dollar bills in ice cold water and want to put them on you and like, like stack them. And I used to be like, why can't I be taller? This is not worth it. Like some girls would be making two, 300, I'd make like 150. And I was like, no, I was like, this is not fair. <laughs> so I kind of stopped doing that one just cause I was like, mm, no, uh, what else? I was, I was in a good club though. My, my home club was, was really good. Uh, there was no champagne room. So, and the girls weren't allowed to drink mostly because the owner was like not dealing with a bunch of drunk strippers every night anymore. So they, I guess they used to be able to drink. And then when I showed up, they were like no more alcohol. Uh, so we didn't have a champagne room, which was good. When I went to work like in Vegas and stuff, it was a little bit more challenging because I wasn't, that wasn't how I made money. I was used to making money off like bachelor parties that would come in and just like tip me for like beating the guy up on stage with his own belt. Um, so that was like my thing. Uh, so it was a little bit more challenging in other clubs, but it really allowed me to like be more of like a performer style because I didn't want to create intimate relationships with men. Um, and so I really tried to be more of the entertainer in that sense where I'm like, okay, I'm going to give you a really good show, but you're not going to get my number. I don't want to go home with you. I'm not even going to give you the inkling that I even like you, but you're, I'm going to dance so well that you're just going to want to give me money. And so that was my selling feature. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to dance well enough that I don't have to talk to you. <laughs> oh my God, that, that's the way. dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, I don't want to dance on you. It works I will sometimes. dance over yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. 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 So once I learned a couple of tricks to change the game, I was like, I don't have to sell my soul. I just have to <laughs> Exactly. The money maker pole moves. That's why you, you know every dancer is yeah. gonna have like two or three, and then they add their own little flair, and that's how you make your money. You have your yeah. like, you know, your few moves yeah. that you do, and then you'd be like yelling at other dancers for copying you. <laughs> or playing your song. Remember, <laughs> my god, I remember one time there was this girl. <laughs> I literally watched her do my entire set. Like she, song for song, move for move. And then I was on stage after her and I was like, oh my God, this fucking person, I can't believe this. So I like said something to her afterwards because I was like, listen, like, I love you. But if I ever watch you do my entire set again, I'm when I'm here and follow you, I'm going to be very upset and I'm going to come and I'm going to come on stage. I'm going to outdo you. And she was like, okay, I understand. 
and then did it again. So that didn't work too well. <laughs> but um, no one listens. <laughs> no, they don't. I mean, whatever. I mean, at, at the end of the day, did I really care that she was taking my moves? Not really. I just cared that I followed her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I got to come up with something new. <laughs> right. Everyone was like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there was a couple things I did that she couldn't do. I used to pick dollar bills oh. bills up with my boobs, and she was like, she didn't have big boobs, so she couldn't do that. So that's just like what I did. So I was yeah. like, guys used to come in, they'd be like, how many can you pick up? And I was like, line up how many you think I can't pick up, and let's see if I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love you know, it. Gonna keep a couple tricks up the sleeve. I love that. I love it. Fire from my butt, but paper, paper cut <laughs> stuff. Oh, you better like, you better do it, like, fold it over and do it on the top of your butt instead. I'm like, do like a little, a little twerk action and just grab it from, from it being folded. I'll show you. Where, where were you six years ago? Let me start. Yeah. <laughs> I will show you. I love Good it. Fun. Yeah, we need a little workshop. I know. I, I oh, thought about doing like stripper classes, like stripper like workshops for like how to make money in the industry. But it's, yeah. it's been a tough balance because a lot of poll is trying to get away from that. And so, especially with college age too, I think that like I feel a little bit awkward, kind of like perpetuating that. As and you know, BPF does events inside strip clubs as it is. So I, I'm not scout. We're not a scout for strip clubs. You know what I mean. And so I've always been reluctant to do that. But I do um, a lot of privates when it comes to dancers. I always tell them to do the private lessons just because uh, it's a little bit more intimate. You know, when you're trying to show somebody how to take their underwear off with their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> right like what we teach in the class is definitely I mean it's it's some of it maybe but like a lot of it is far be, from what you would use in the club <laughs> well, to be are, honest like, you could teach that for like relationships like I know some couples who'll be like okay I could take that home <laughs> oh, yeah, we've, done, we've done a couple we've done couple lap dance uh workshops which are really good especially around like Valentine's Day we always do our couples workshop um so that's always really fun um there are a lot of like dance classes now they're like heels you know we do like pleasers orders through the studio twice a month because everyone always wants the shoes which is awesome um there is a novelty aspect that's growing i think i think first that poll needed to like just have the acceptance as like this is a tough in, you know, this is a very tough thing to learn. And, you know, we need to establish ourselves as like a real exercise and then we can go back to the novelty. Um, and I find like even more so with like Instagram now and stuff, people love like the choreographed classes, like where everyone choreographs a routine. Like that's a huge part of what we do now. Um, and that was something I had overlooked for a long time just because I tried so much not to do the stripper stuff. You know, I was like, and I think part of it was because I was stripping and I was like, oh, I'm not teaching people how to strip. Like, let me teach them how to pole dance. Uh, but there's a huge industry with that. And I think a lot of the market does want to learn that fun part of it because it is fun. And like, you know, it, it, I think this, honestly, I think the dance classes, like the, the choreographed classes and all that are way, way better workout than learning how to do a trick. And my, my instructor, I remember her telling me when I first started pole dancing, she's like, Stacy, it's not pole tricking, it's pole dancing. And I was like, got a point. Although it's, it's tricking a little bit. Yeah, yeah, right, though the choreo classes are exhausted. It's like a, a whole cardio experience. <laughs> I love the choreo. Uh, I think they're I think they're the best just because of that. I think they're the I think they're just and learning flow and those like mm -hmm. in between movements I think is really important because a lot of times like with pole it can be very trick oriented where like you want to learn that you know that, that jade split or whatever. So it becomes more about doing the trick than it is about like flow and fluidity. And I've seen time and time again, I've seen a couple of things. First, I've seen a lot of performers who are very, very trick oriented, not win competitions because they don't have any dance expression. And you would think that they would win, but like the dance is still really, really important. And then the other thing is that if you learn the move, but can't get in and out of it, like, well, there's a big risk for injury. And also like, if you land that move and you don't look good getting in and out of it and doing those transitional pieces, then the, the, the star movement, the, you know, that, that movement doesn't really make as much of an impact. 
um, because of that, you know, but it makes good, it makes for a good photo. So I can see why, you know, a lot of people want to learn the tricks, but then also like we have to, you know, create that, uh, that flow. And also that I think emphasizes safety a lot too in the classes to uh, show people how to get in and out gracefully. Right. Like we, we love the Gennaro, but how the hell do you get out of it? <laughs> it's too fun. For me, now for me, I love Gennaro too. Like I love it, but I would never perform it. I wouldn't yeah. perform it unless I could get in and out of it gracefully. So that would be like kind of like a trick move that I would be like, okay, yeah, like this would be cool to learn. But for me, like I, I, I think I performed Gennaro like once, and I was like, yeah, no, I almost like I, it wasn't, it was sloppy. So for me, like I would rather have like my like moves that maybe not might not be as difficult, but I look good doing them. And I think that's like even more important to take those simpler moves and adding your own flavor. Like people appreciate that, like spectators appreciate it. And I think like at the end of the day, like being able to take that simple move and make it into your own, like gives gives them gives yourself so much more independence from like what the norm is. It's good to stray from that norm and add, and that's how like new moves are always created too, you know, like just by playing around and like, oh, let me like try to put my like my arm up here and let's see what happens. And then all of a sudden you have like a new trend you know well I have um it's almost 4 30 I have a student here to come in to practice um I can try to move this to the front room <laughs> so that we can continue um yeah because I, I don't want to like end now I'm just worried that the internet is going to be choppy so um I'm going to mute myself for a moment as I transfer to the front Okay. Look at those arms. <laughs> Biceps for days. I know, <laughs> damn. <laughs> oh, we're getting like the full tour. I was gonna say you just got the, almost the whole tour. <laughs> oh, I love to come visit Pole in the Wall. It looks like such a beautiful studio. I love that you guys have like a separate. That's been tough for us, like to find like a separate like area that has like a waiting room and then the pole studio, just because the Boston spaces right now are so, they're like just boxes, you know, and they're not very big. So you're like trying to instead of having a front room, you're having an extra piece of equipment, you know. So that's been like that's why we we do now like 15 minutes in between our classes just because we need that time to like get people in and out because we don't have the front room wow. I miss that. chris how long have you been pole dancing goodness i started in a strip club six years Which ago club? um um the marty Grub, the x room here in springfield Mass. oh in springfield right yeah is it still that Italian uh, owner guy? He's like Italian. Um, the I know Sammy is still the manager, and there is an Italian owner. I never met the man. We always used to get the wife. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did she used to be yeah, a dancer? We, no, not that I know. We had the woman's side, and then downstairs it was us on the men's side. Oh, that's cool. I don't, I don't remember there being a men's side, but maybe I heard about. It. I only worked at Mardi Gras a few times, just because like the drive was like crazy and I didn't like drinking alcohol when I, when I was a dancer, just cause like, I would get, like, I would fall. <laughs> I can't walk. <laughs> I can barely walk in those shoes sober. <laughs> but um, yeah, like I worked at the Mardi Gras was cool. I met the owner cause he used to like put girls up. He had like the hotel above yeah. or whatever. So he put me up a few times. Like he, he wanted me to work there, but it was just, it was too much. I didn't like being on stage. I mean, I liked being on stage for a long time, but I work better as like, on the, I like to fly around. And, and so like, I was like, in like intruding on other dancers, like on each yeah. side of me, because I like needed space. So um, that was a little bit, a little bit tough to, to do, but yeah, that was yeah, like I one of I always used to take other like customers drinks because the poles would be right there and then like their drink ledge right there and I'm like oh my god this is a such a big <laughs> yeah it's, it's tough um but is a guy side the same thing where you kind of like stay on stage they do it that yeah. style yeah um it's a whole square stage and there are three poles one semi-static one 
semi-static and spin, one static and one completely spin. Did they, um, how many people did they have on stage at once? Uh, on the weekend, we would have maybe four to six guys at a time taking turns, but then there'd be like a half hour where they display all of us like me. <laughs> they ever do that i know with girl clubs they used to do this they ever do the thing where they like prance you out on stage in the beginning of the night they you would know? do that for us an hour before like there was an yeah. hour or two before they were closed yeah oh okay and then they like pranced you on yeah 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 we they did yeah. i worked out like, the, i remember the cabaret used to do that and they used to like have all the dancers come out like in the beginning of the shift and you had to do a spin on the pole, which sucked because you were like had like half your eye done. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, oh, I'm a pirate right now because like I'm mean, not done with my makeup and I got to go walk around the pole. <laughs> the girls used to get uh, so mad at that. Oh my god! I got a couple settlement checks. I got a couple settlement checks from studios. Oh my! Because <laughs> so the girl actually, I know how I told the story about the girl who copied me on stage. Well, that girl yeah. ended up, she she was one of the first girls to hire a lawyer in Boston to sue the in to sue the um, strip clubs. Wow. Because strip clubs were basically you can't so strip we were 1099, which basically were self-contracted, which means I'm my own boss. You can't force me to spend money. Like it's illegal for us to tip out when we're our own boss like you can't force that so all the clubs are like oh you have to tip out the djs and the bouncers and tip out the biz and tip out the house fee like you can't charge me a house fee if i'm a 1099 contractor but for years like it just was the norm it was the norm and i actually it was funny because i remember um when we did our first like event inside the golden banana uh, just like a couple years not even a couple years ago uh, i had a girl write to me and she was like you know like you're you know, basically like, you know, the golden banana, like, you know, they mispaid like all of their staff and you're, you know, basically I was like helping them in some way. And I was like, uh, listen, first of all, the girl who brought the lawsuit to the golden banana is one of my really good friends. And she like really helped get a lot of money for the, you know, girls like me and the strippers like me who were getting double dipped for 10 years. You know what I mean? I was like, and second of all, like it was the norm. It wasn't like they knew they were, they might've known they were doing something wrong, but they just weren't going to do anything about it until somebody grabbed them, you know, grabbed them by the balls and said, Hey, listen, like, this isn't right. We actually care about, you know, how our exotic dancers and our sex workers and how they make their money. And we're going to come after you now, you know, and it took, I think a lot of bravery from a lot of you know, a lot of girls in this industry to stand up to some of the owners, the owners, like I remember owners yelling at me, like grown men screaming at me, trying to belittle me in front of other men who were drunk. You know what I mean? And these were the, these were the guys who were supposed to protect us. You know what I mean? These were the management guys. And it's like, oh, you have that. And they know you're in, you're in dire straits. They know, you know, a lot of times that you need them more than they need you. And so to have that sort of power over somebody, you know, like, especially the industry as a whole, like you have a lot of, a lot of women's particularly, um, you know, who go into strip clubs who are there because, you know, they have to be. They have no other options. They're, you know, trying to support their kids or got out of a battered relationship or just starting over. And they knew they had that power. So then to, to do that and then to complain and say, hey, I don't want to tip out when I should be getting paid for my hours here. Um, you know, and you're forcing, you're taking a percentage of my profit. It's like, if you go into a champagne room, I tip out, a, a, I'll tip out a, a, a club a hundred dollars. And then if I bring a guy into a champagne room, they're taking 400 more dollars of my money. Of that thousand dollar bottle, they're taking forty percent. So I'm like, you're paying me to be here. I have to pay you to be here, and you're going to take a percentage of my profit. That's illegal. So you know, it took a lot of courage to stand up to that. You know, and most strip clubs are owned by men. You know, and these men, like some of them, I mean, some of them are good. Some of them just like are on power trips. You know, and they they don't they don't think about their effect on the people that work for them. They just care about the bottom line. And then they all had to pay you for have, it. You have been through it. <laughs> I mean, that's how it was, you know? And I, and it was funny too, because that comment, you know, I was like kind of taken aback because I, I never really saw it that way, you know? And I was like, 
I actually been it. Oh, were you a dancer? Because I was a dancer for like, you know, 12 plus years. And like, what was your experience? Oh, well, no, I'm not a dancer. And I was like, so you're commenting about a club that you really don't know a lot about because of something that's like a perception that you think this club was really bad when actually they settled and settled with all the dancers and made good. And uh, like, they're a great club to work for. Golden Banana is awesome. I wish I could work there, but I know too many people now. <laughs> Just be awkward. I remember going in there. Oh my God. I remember going in there for an amateur night and my grandmother's neighbor was there. It was like something yeah, you never that. ever want to see inside of a strip club was there. And I was doing the amateur night and I was like, oh my God, I can't work here. Yeah, <laughs> we would we would get like in the closet like government officials and it'd be like low key hush hush like Ooh, get that hush hush money. Yeah, we got <laughs> oh my god, like people higher up people from Connecticut coming just to the strip club to get their little thing. I was like, wow. <laughs> no, it's nuts. Um, yeah, it's funny too because like. I noticed like I was trying to go to these strip clubs like far enough away from Boston where nobody would recognize me. But then the patrons were this, just thinking the same thing. Like, hey, I'm going to go to this club far enough from Boston that nobody will recognize yeah. me. And then you end up seeing your gym teacher. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my God. It was crazy. When somebody Good told time. me I was just like my mother, I was like when I was butt naked, I was like, OK, this is a little, little traumatizing right now. Yeah. <laughs> That is too funny. I love it. <laughs> yeah. My gym teacher was the greatest though. And he did get a private dance mostly because he was my gym teacher and all his buddies were like, no way you have to get a dance. <laughs> and I, took, I took the money. I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most important part. Sure. Oh yeah. It was, it was crazy. <laughs> but it's what it is. Yeah. The clubs were, I mean, I grew a lot, at, you know, being in the clubs, you know, and just the experience as a whole, like, I find that, like, you know, for me, like, a lot of the women that I worked with, like, they, they kind of became, like, man haters, some of them, and, like, I always, like, was the opposite, I always kind of felt bad for the guys who came in, because I'm, like, some of them are just lonely, and they just don't want to be rejected, and, like, they just want that little bit of a connection, or they just want to be, like, entertained, you know, um, and then the, the girls, I thought, were more, were, were more scary than the customers. I was more afraid of the other dancers, you know, because those are the, those are the people that you're actually competing with, you know. And on some level, you're all friends, but on some level, you're still fighting for the same dollar from the same guy. And so that always, like, I think, created a little bit of a rift in some of my friendships with the girls that I dance with. The girls that I dance with, I'm friends with like most of them now, and I'm better friends with them now because we're not in that competitive environment anymore you know and so I think that um it's been really nice to have that like connection without the competitiveness and actually like kind of brought us all closer together and then you know obviously time like walk walking away and then having time for reflection you know I went through my period where I felt very traumatized by stripping you know um and now that I've kind of handled that and you know grown from my experiences and you know one of the biggest I remember last couple of years ago when I was at a retreat, I was, you know, just kind of going through it. And one of the women, you know, was like, let's talk. And I told her about my background and how I was, you know, felt guilty for being a drug addict and told, and she was like, you were a stripper. And I was like, yeah, she's like, that was your coping me mechanism. It's like, that was you coping with the trauma of what you were going through. You can't feel guilty about that. And so that was like a real eye opener for me in a lot of ways where I was like, wow, I actually was traumatized a little bit by this as much as it was fun and funny and we had a great time and it's a party atmosphere. Like there's this other dark side of it that is not so glamorous, you know, that like, you know, and that sort of is my reluctance too to teach girls how to strip because it's not about pole dancing. It's one-on-one -on -one contact with men. You would probably never talk to unless you were getting paid. <laughs> right. Like that's why I tell um, dancers too, when they're interested in, you know, like stripping, I'm like, you are a salesperson. <laughs> like that's what you have to become. <laughs> like you're selling a product yourself. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you have to sell yourself, which I think sometimes it's the hardest thing you know, um, it's, it was hard to be a dancer in a lot of ways because I didn't look like Barbie, you know, and I, there were these girls that were, I thought 
models, you know, and they were, um, you know, and it was hard to, and when you're walking around and, you know, you talk to three guys and they reject you. Hey, you want to dance? No, I'm good. Oh, thanks. I'll just go fuck myself. You know, like, okay, great. And then you have to go with a smile to the next guy. And you're like, hey, you want to dance? You know, and then sometimes you start thinking, is it me? Am I, you know, am I the one that isn't good enough? You know, why don't, why don't these guys like me tonight? Or, you know, and so there was always that sort of negativity that came with that, um, you know, and, and it's hard to look past that on a night when you have bills to pay and you still got to put a smile on your face. And you're like, I have to smile through this bullshit. You know, I had one guy of my life make me cry. One guy, one time. And it was the only time I'd ever smoked weed at a strip club. And I was like, I'm going to smoke. I'm going to try it. Of course, wasn't ready. And I went on stage and this, this guy and a girl were there. It was a couple. And they were like, wow, you're like a really good pole dancer. And I was like, oh yeah, I just, just like opened up my own business. Now I teach pole dancing. You tell the guy was like super insecure and his like girlfriend or wife was like kind of into it. And he, and he just looked at me with this like smirk on his face. And he was like, oh, your parents must be proud of you. And I was just like, wow. And that like caught me. Cause I was like, okay, first of all, like, I don't really have any parents. So that was like a part of it, but I was like, damn, like that guy got me that guy got me. And I was just like, wow, something that I was like kind of bragging about and just got cut down. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, well, he's paying for pussy. So like, whatever, you know, <laughs> you gotta kind of like look the other way and see who's actually t- saying, saying what they're saying to you, you know, but yeah, that was, that was something that like rocked me to my core. And I was like, wow, this guy fucking got me. Only time I ever cried though. Damn that pot. <laughs> 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 yep. usually that 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 sucks I mean the, actually the reason why I stopped stripping was because I started smoking pot and I started like thinking about it a little bit differently <laughs> and I couldn't bring myself to be the salesperson anymore <laughs> yeah because you're yeah. like uh, no I just want to chill now <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, couldn't, I, could, I only smoked pot one I was a drug I, I loved I mean I loved coke cocaine was nice when you were stripping not nice but it was gave you a sense of detachment without drinking and you could kind of still drive at the end of the night you know on some levels uh and Percocets were awesome because they helped my body and I didn't feel any pain um you know but obviously I remember Oh my God. I remember the first time ever, second time I ever went on stage, I was at the cabaret lounge and they used to put me, they put two girls on at the same time for the first show. And I went on stage with this other girl and she, I was just looking at her and she was like, awesome dancer. You know, she'd been dancing for a while. She had her style and all that stuff. And guys were like throwing tens and 20 and they were all throwing it to her. You know what I mean? But, and I was still kind of learning, but I remember like getting off stage and she looked at me and she was like, yeah, you did. Okay. Like, she's like, so do you like do any drugs? And I was like, no, she's like, you will. And that was like an omen for like, and I looked at her and I was like, well, I don't do them now. No. She's like, you will. Someone said that to me too. Really? (laughs) Okay. I'm not the only one. What the hell? Yeah. That is too fucking funny. Oh, Oh my God. Yeah, I, I, I stopped stripping because my last night someone slipped something in my drink and never went back. I just never went back after that. Yeah, that's <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. That's why I didn't drink at strip clubs. I just carried bottled water. I was really like, at, I used to walk around with a Lysol spray. So, like, if a guy had to like sit down, like, after he got up, I'd spray the whole area with Lysol. So, and, <laughs> I love it. Oh, that was bad. I was, I was like, COVID, I didn't, COVID wasn't too much of a stretch for me when it came to that. I was like, ooh, mass and, you know, antibacterial. I'm all about this. <laughs> Especially yeah. after working. In the club. I remember there was an outbreak of scabies one time at my club. Oh. They made us all like get this, like, it was like a gel you had to wear on your body. They made everybody do it. And we all the dancers. So they gave us all the prescription for it. And it was like a gel. We all had to wear it and they closed down for a day. <laughs> all right. That's, I, oh, didn't yeah. <laughs> I, I got that from a nursing home. I didn't know that could happen in a strip club. That's crazy. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't even I, know what it was. I was like, what? 
Yeah. So there's <laughs> so, like, right, like something happened, like, like in the or, like yeah. the lap dance rooms because we're all using them and like the stuff goes in the couch and then we all get that. it. Yeah. I, brought, I bring my own towel to sit on. Maybe I brought it to the nursing home. Let me stop that. Oh my God. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. The scape, scapes outbreak. That was hysterical. That was like my first year dancing too. I was like, what am I getting into? Uh, <laughs> like, like is this part of it? Is this normal? <laughs> yeah, is this normal? What's normal anymore? Uh, uh. <laughs> It's so funny. Actually, there was um, one of my friends worked at Disney World and she like like the group of dancers that worked this trolley show all got scabies together at one point. So it's not just <laughs> strip clubs. Oh. I guess they were sharing like the same costumes or whatever. Yeah, and, like, I worked yeah. for Disney. I actually used to work oh. for Disney. And they have a <laughs> um like their own dry cleaning service. So like when I was a I worked in the um in the kitchen at one of the restaurants, I was a culinary major and uh and so all the chef's uniforms, like you had to bring them back to get laundered and they had like a code. So like you would get like four a week or whatever, one for every chef and they would get laundered through Disney. So you would have to go to their costume department and do the drop off and pickups. So yeah, I could totally see that happening. That's crazy. Oy. Yeah, yeah. You know how many people like those costumes? I know. Well, I used to try to wash my, they would yell at me because they, they keep track of them. And if you don't exchange them, they take it out of your paycheck. Yeah. Gosh, they're like, you need to get these Disney scabies or else. Yeah, like the only scabies are allowed are Disney scabies. Disney scabies, <laughs> yeah. Not ones that come from your house. <laughs> yeah, right? So that was like, yeah, that was one of the first years. Oh my God. Wow. What else? I'm trying to think of some funny ones. There was, a, oh my God, the guy, I had like a high, high end like lawyer he's like on TV. He's like one of those personal injury lawyers on TV. And he used to come in every Monday night and he used to give me boatloads of cash. So I didn't care, but he would be like telling me he was in love with me and he was going to like leave his wife. And he was like, Oh, I have an eight year old kid. I'm like, Oh, I don't do kids. I'm like, no, you have a kid. Sorry. I just like, <laughs> I feel bad. You have to like try to do something and be like, Oh my God. Like you, I literally like, no, like what's, what inkling am I giving you other than the fact that you're paying me to stand here naked that I would want anything to do with you outside of this environment? Like, I really like, and some guys liked it. They liked that I was a bitch. They were like, I was like mean and like, they would love it. I remember I got in trouble one time because I like choked a guy out too hard. I used to bring guys on stage. My thing was, if there was a bachelor party, the the DJ used to always call me for the bachelor parties because I would do a show where I would basically, if a guy was wearing a belt, I would take the belt off, wrap it around his neck and walk him on all fours around the stage. And then I would have him go onto the pole, hold on to the pole. And I would have the DJ play smack my bitch up and I would smack him in the butt with, it, with his own belt. And then I would climb up. One of my signature moves for this is I would climb up to the top of the pole and I would go into like a split grip and do like an aerial walk over his face and then like split down and like be like close <laughs> like over his face that was like my thing and then I started doing it to women and made more money so I was like oh yeah so now then I started like bringing the girls on the stage I'm like fuck these guys I'll just beat them <laughs> I was like they don't get the split action women will get the split action oh yeah that was so much fun but they loved it. And it was a cool way too, because then I could like make people part of the show without actually like a lot of, a lot of dancers in my club wanted to get girls naked and they were kind of aggressive about it because they knew it'd make them more money. So there were times where like, I remember, remember a girl crying because she didn't want it. And the girl had gotten her naked and was very upset about it. And so I was like, well, how do you like integrate women who like want to be inside of a strip club partying, having a good time without making them feel awkward and make them look good and so I was like oh I did like this the split trick over and it, it always like it always made the woman look good because she didn't have to get naked she was just a little part she didn't have to do much other than be there but it like just the participation element was enough to like it be inclusive I think and then like towards the end of my like stripping days like I actually had more women customers than men which I preferred I preferred women um, and it, and that was like part of it, you know, is that they got to be like part of an act without feeling uncomfortable. And that's always a challenge, especially inside of a strip club, uh, especially as a woman, as a patron inside of a strip club. Wow. 
You have so many amazing stories. <laughs> I feel like we should do a, an extra segment on the stripper, stripper there's stories. Actually, um, there's actually a girl, her name's um, Anne-Marie, Anne-Marie AMD or something. I'll have to send you the link. She does a, a podcast out of LA with uh, just for sex workers and strippers. Love it. But she Perfect. To, I remember she at, a, at a strip club and she used to do my trick with the with the ceiling, the legs on the ceiling. That's kind of like yes. how I yeah I was like wow this girl like brought it to a whole other level but yeah she uh she does like a stripper podcast out of LA it's like all like industry people I know there needs to be like a better like you know more open it's hard to talk about some of those stories too because like if you're like used to be a dancer like I'm lucky enough that I own my own business and I teach pole dancing that I can talk freely about my stripping career but if I'm a teacher you know in fourth grade that's not gonna happen you know um so you know, I'm lucky that I get to share like a lot of these stories, but, you know, hopefully it, it allows other people to like open up, you know, in hope, you know, be able to share and laugh and, you know, and it's always important, I think, like to find that common ground, especially with other dancers too, because it's just, it's something that people who don't strip won't understand. It definitely is like a sisterhood and a brotherhood there of like, you know, we went through that. Like we had to literally entertain drunk men for money and put ourselves in dangerous situations. Uh, I remember when the girl uh, got found in the dumpster outside of Alex's, that was a big wake up call. I got followed home one time, uh, a couple times. One time was so bad, I pulled into a police station. They followed me all the way to Boston. Um, Yeah, another time I had a guy, he found my day job. He found where I work. I used to be a hairdresser and he found me. And that was, that was his words when he came into my salon. He's like, oh, I called every salon in the state looking for you and I found you. And I was like, that was a wake up call as to I need to get a stage name because I didn't have a stage name the first time. I was like, oh, I'll just go by Stacy, whatever. And I was like, no, I need to create like a whole other alter ego to protect myself. Uh, and that was scary too, because I had worked for my dad at the time and, you know, my sister was working. I was like, you know, put other people in danger, you know, you got to be very careful, you know, in that industry too. Um, so there's a lot of creeps. Another time I remember this guy came in, he was like, he was really nice. Like he seemed really nice. And he like spent a ton of money. And I was like, wow, okay. He left and the cops were waiting outside for him because he had a warrant out of, he had a warrant for his arrest. And they used to come in and run all the, the license plates at my club. And so they were just, I felt bad. He like spent all this money and then had to like bail himself out of jail or whatever. I was like, damn, that sucks for you. Uh, another time a guy came in, he like, it was the first set, you know, first it's like day shift on a Saturday. It's like kind of quiet. This guy comes in and throws like a thousand dollars, like something like unheard of, like for, yeah, it was a lot of money. And we're like, wow, we all, we're all like, I'm going on stage next. No, I'm going on stage next now. And he left within like, I don't know. He, he didn't even get a chance to see the second girl. And it turns out he robbed a restaurant down the street and decided to come into the strip club and spend all the money. I don't know why he, what he was thinking or whatever, but the girl on stage had to go to court and like testify. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, so kind of, kind of thankful in some ways it wasn't me, but I was like, damn, I would have liked to make that money, but not, not to have it on public record that like you were stripping and then had to like testify because some guy robbed a restaurant and then came in. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> I remember that too. Oh my God. I remember it so well. Oh that was crazy. Gosh. Oh yeah. Insanity. We'll have to do a strip club pod. I know. Yeah, we definitely need to. <laughs> <laughs> right like things, things you wouldn't think about but they happened <laughs> yeah, I, know. I know i need to like start writing them down because then i'll like yeah. i'll like once i'm like oh my god i remember that like oh. <laughs> some good ones that like will stand out once in a blue moon the guy robbing a restaurant was like that was crazy. That was like hysterical, actually. I was like, oh my God. And the, girl, and the girl, it couldn't have been the worst girl to be on stage because her boyfriend was a cop and she was trying to be a cop and trying to hide it that she was like a dancer and then had to like testify for this on like a federal indictment. So it like went on record that she was working at Zachary's as a dancer. I was like, oh my God, I felt so bad for her. I was like, oh, poor thing. But she made a thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like the luckiest unlucky situation. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, I, th- I think, I mean, we should ask one more question. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I, I, I was wondering if you had any advice. I know you gave advice for like business owners, but do you have any advice for maybe strippers that want to get into the, the industry and, and what they should look for or um, strippers that want to get into the stripping industry or to the pole? Yeah. Industry? Yeah. Um, maybe a little bit of both. Like maybe if you can okay. give some advice for dancers uh, who are confused about everything. <laughs> So my advice, if you want to be an exotic dancer, have an exit plan when you start. Have an exit plan and have goals. All the girls that I knew that had set goals for themselves and achieved them are all very successful. I know strippers that own five, six houses. You know, they have their shit together. So go in it. Uh, I think the intention of when you start, you know, Personally, I think the intention should always be for money, but some people have other intentions, I guess. Um, You know, but go into it with your exit strategy. It's money that will come very fast and go very fast. It's, you know, a short lived career of maybe 10 to 15 years before you really, it will take its toll one way or another, whether it's physically or mentally or both. Um, And then for those who are looking to maybe stay in the strip club industry and maybe try to transition out, uh, save your money, save your money. And, you know, anything, I think that anything that people invest in that betters themselves is always a good investment. So whether it's a class or a certification, I think certifications are definitely worth it just to have that piece of paper, um, especially if you are not working in a studio full-time or part-time. Um, I think that is always a good investment. Um, you know, and also like getting certified in other areas, maybe yoga or dance or having some other background, because I really feel like that brings a lot to the table, especially in terms of like communicating uh, the material to students. Uh, the biggest challenge I had faced when I was just starting as, a, as an instructor was not killing myself by demonstrating a move over and over again. It was how do I describe in language, in words, what I am doing? How do you describe a spin in words so that people understand and you don't have to demonstrate over and over again? And that, you know, it's definitely taken a lot of practice, um, you know, and so that, you know, having those other certifications really helps to translate the material. you know, in terms of like teaching and just developing your own style. So, you know, and keep up with it. Like practice makes perfect, you know, like just constant practice will, will do so much, you know, whether it's practicing teaching or practicing on the pole or practicing in front of a mirror. I remember literally being a baby stripper and teaching myself how to twerk with a piece of material, like over my butt, trying to like pop it in a mirror when I was a baby stripper. So, I mean, even that's important, you know? <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much for the advice and yeah, for everything yeah. that you shared. Yeah. Yeah. This was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. We'll yes. talk about, like about everything. So I definitely want to do another um, pull in the wall takeover. Um, yes. love to guys. Yeah. We have to collab a lot more. I want to collab with a lot of people. This is exciting. Yeah, I love that you, like you, you mentioned guys are doing this podcast because it's like a huh. great way to like bridge everybody. We needed it. The industry. I love that you, you keep mentioning that too because I I have really been finding that that's so important more and more. Like we all need to to stick together, as studio owners, and and help each other, and and it's we'll really all grow. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> it's a really small circle where we're trying yeah. to make you know, um, and I think like leaders in the industry need to you know, make themselves more available so that we can pass on. And I like, I don't want somebody to struggle like I did. You know, I want somebody to be able to come in and have a successful career or business, you know, in this industry. And I think there's a lot of different ways to do that. And I think, I don't think that, you know, closing yourself off or holding secrets or whatever really is the way to grow this industry. You know, this industry has grown because of studios and studio owners and people taking risks and expanding their businesses. And, you know, I want 
there to be a studio everywhere. I mean, I, it's awesome. It's a great community, you know, like have, I think Instagram, like as much as it causes a lot of strife, I think it's actually like improved the poll industry because there's like all these hashtags you can follow and see all these new people and like instant friends. Like I literally see people and I'm like, like I look at them, like they're celebrities. I'm like, oh my God, I know you, you know, like it's awesome. It's so cool to have that. Yes, it is really like we're all celebrities though. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Like, I mean, I know when I, where you went into this, I really wanted to share everybody's story like students, um, teachers, stars, studio owners. So it really means a lot that you're excited <laughs> because we do want to share everybody because everybody has a story and I feel like everybody has something to offer. We can learn something from everyone. Yeah, 100%. And we only learn more by sharing, you know what I mean? Yes. So, you know, I, didn't, I think definitely like everyone sharing their stories, you know, how they got started and what they're doing, it just helps to make this industry better. You know what I mean? Um, trying to, you know, close yourself off really. And I, I know just from experience of, you know, doing that unintentionally, like it, it hurt me in the long run. I wish I had been, you know, a lot more open with my business practices and my plans so that, you know, I think Boston, you know, could have, could have been way far ahead in the game if I had, you know, just collabed more and reached out and shared, shared, what I was feeling at the time and shared my experiences. And you know what? Maybe I wouldn't have been a, as big of a drug addict if I had told people and felt comfortable enough to say, hey, listen, I need help. You know, so to be able to offer those spaces to people who do need help and say, hey, listen, you can come here, you know, you can come here and, you know, we're here for you no matter what. And I think, you know, being able to offer that is such a, such a blessing. Thank you. I have so much love for you. Thank you, you guys. So much for everything. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll call you later. So. Yeah. <laughs> Too funny. Thank you. Cool. I guess we'll do we'll do our sign out. Oh yeah, I know. I need to see these boots. <laughs> in a different location. <laughs> well, I don't have I don't have heels because of burning. I have dusty boots. Yes. Love it. And I'll pull no. any any day. Actually, I'd rather <laughs> those are Burning Man stripper heels. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Just like whatever. I love it. <laughs> yes. We gotta make it to Burning Man one day, one year. Yes. Oh my god. Oh cool. yeah, no, we're gonna start a pole dancing camp for sure. That's, That's what I'm. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Oh, it's just it. a lot. It's actually like a really lot of work. So like learning like water sources and like like waste. Like I was like literally picking trash for like, I was like, who left the sticker on this avocado? It can't get composted. I'm like screaming at people. It's like, so <laughs> it, it's like, yeah, it's bad. I'm one of those. Um, <laughs> so yeah, for sure. No, we're definitely going to get a pole camp. Like we, it's already in the works. We got this. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Well, stay tuned everyone. Pole, pole camp at Burning Man coming soon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening and watching this episode of Pole on the Call with the amazing Stacey from Boston Pole Fitness. My name is Mandy Mack. And I am Chris Rivers. And we are signing off. We're signing off. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs>